things. It's an investment. The preachers that you've heard right now, you heard them for 45 minutes. But if you take these home, you can hear them all year long. And they can encourage you all year long. What you would pay for these DVDs and CDs, you, you can say that's a lot of money. But you know what? <laughs> when you go to McDonald's and you buy a cheeseburger, french fries, and a Diet Coke, it's going to cost you as much as the CDs cost you. And that hamburger will be gone the next day. And to the wrong place. This word will go into your heart, into your soul. Amen. No, don't, don't be afraid to invest. We've heard some of the finest preaching human ears will ever hear. Boy, wasn't this a great end time? God just picked up every, every preacher to a different level. My Lord. I hear, I hear these men preach and I say, what in the world am I doing trying to preach on Sundays? When I listen to them, I, I feel like hiding in a cave. My Lord, these men can preach. I, I, I heard uh, Romo Jr., and I said to myself, now, why couldn't I preach like that when I was that age? <laughs> Even now, I really enjoyed him. That was, that was good. <laughs> Let's go to preachers a good hand clap. It's been great. It has been tomorrow morning. Brother Jeffers will be with us in the morning. Those of you that will still be in town, if you care to be with us to hear another message, I guarantee you, if you come in the morning, you'll get a greater blessing than going to San Francisco. If you want to go see men holding men's hands, go to San Francisco. If you want to see women kissing each other, go to San Francisco. But if you want to hear the word of God, we're here. In the morning. Our English service is at, at, nine, at 11 o'clock. We have a Spanish service at, at 9 in the morning, and we have the English at 11. All right? And Brother Jeffers will be with us tomorrow. One more, everybody say one more. One more. Turn, turn to your neighbor and tell them, fasten your seat belts. Because we're, because we're coming into a landing. And it's been a good flight. Amen. Has it been a good flight? But who knows? It may not be a landing. We may be going up. Dr. Jeffers with us. Clap your hands, go to people that shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Somebody open up your mouth and shout hallelujah. I'm in Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Beginning in verse 1, reading down through to verse 4. Romans chapter 7, verse 1 through 
verse 4. Know you not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of the husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Would you lift your hands right now and begin to open up your mouth and let us begin to worship. Amen. Before you're seated, would you greet somebody and tell them I love you with the love of the Lord. Now, God bless you as you're seated. Now, I don't want you to let Bishop fool you. Because, you know, Bishop just came up and talked about when he hears these preachers, he wants to run and hide. I don't want you... I don't want you to let him fool you because just before I came in to preach this morning, we were in the cafe. Bishop walked up to me and said, now listen, I know sometimes you have a hard time knowing what to say, so I have some notes that... <laughs> I mean, I love Bishop Lopez. He's so fatherly. Man. We thank God for Sister Lopez. She's very motherly. We thank God for them both and all the bishops and ministers. We thank God for all of you that are here in the house of the Lord giving the things to God. I want to speak to you this morning simply on this subject. Married to another. Married to another. You must recognize that God is a God of plans. But the truth of the matter is, the plan is God. In St. John chapter 1, verse 1, what we oftentimes quote, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Greek term for word is logos. It means the thoughts, the plans, the discourse of God. So in the beginning was the plan. Amen. The plan was with God because the plan was God. Yeah. Now the Greeks who believed in arete, which means excellence, they said that in order to have a plan, you must have a thought. So in the beginning was a thought. The thought was with God because the thought was God. Because God was thinking about himself. But the Hebrews say, wait a minute. You can't have a thought without having a thinker. 
So in the beginning was a thinker, and the thinker thought a thought because the thinker was thinking about himself. So you must understand God's desire from the beginning. Let's go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I will try to move exponentially because there are some things that God just wants to give understanding to. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we were just going to look at verse 45. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. You must understand the mind and the plans of God. What is God's purpose? Why is God trying to do stuff that he's trying to do? So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living spirit. Everyone say the last Adam. Now, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. The, the first Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. The, the first Adam and the last Adam. Notice Jesus is not the second Adam. He's the last Adam because the book stops here. He's the last Adam. The first Adam was a prototype. In other words, when people go to build a building, what they first build is a model. The first Adam was the model. The last Adam was the building. So if we want to understand the purpose of the last Adam, we look at the first Adam. Now listen to what he goes on to say. Verse 47, the first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. So the first Adam, the Bible says that he had dominion. He stood by himself, he stood alone, and he had dominion over all things. He names every animal, and the Lord says, not the man, the Lord says it is not good for the man to be alone. Now that word good has different translations, but the one that really fits to the text, it means pleasurable. It is not pleasurable for the man to be by himself. So what does God do? He puts the man, everyone say, asleep. asleep. Now, oftentimes when I teach men's meeting, I tell men, don't understand it. Don't be mad if you don't understand women. You were asleep when they were made. <laughs> Which means it takes God to give you revelation of her. You just don't understand her because you live with her. So the Lord puts him to sleep, and out of his side, God takes and forms his wife, a woman, a wound man, a female, a feminine male, a counterpart, not taken from his feet, not to be stepped on, not taken from his head, not to be over, but taken from his side to be side by side. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Jesus, before he took the name Jesus, was known as Jehovah, the self-existing one. The last Adam stood by himself, having dominion over all things. But he decided it was not pleasurable for him to be alone. So he put himself to sleep. What do you mean? Death. He died on the cross. He's pierced. Out of his side comes blood and water, which symbolizes birth. He puts himself to sleep and brings his bride out of his side. No man takes my life. I'll lay it down and I'll pick it back up again. The first Adam lost the battle in the garden. The last Adam won the battle in the garden of Gethsemane. The first Adam ate the fruit of the tree and died and his wife died also. The last Adam ate the fruit of the tree. Cursed is every man that dies upon a tree. He ate the curse, but this Adam had power to get himself up and get his wife up too. God wants a wife. 
This is the whole plan of salvation. God wants to be loved, someone to share love with. God is looking for a lover. Someone say a lover. lover. Now here is the issue that we have. Let's go to the book of Isaiah. So God, what he did is he, I'm in chapter uh, 54 of the book of Isaiah. So what God did is he began to select Israel as a nation. And in selecting Israel as a nation, on the Mount Sinai, he marries her. Moses was the attendant. The first rules to the marriage, thou shall have no other gods before me. What do you mean? I'm your only husband. This is a monogamous relationship. You don't have no other gods. I'm it. Don't be putting nobody in my bed because I'm a jealous God. I'll fire you up. I'm a consuming fire. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But this was never his full intention to have Israel alone as a bride. Watch this, watch this. He would not violate his own laws of having two wives at a time. His ultimate idea was to marry humanity, not just one nation. But he was married to Israel, so he could not marry humanity and be married to Israel. Otherwise, he'd be an adulterer. All right, you got to see this first. Come to Isaiah chapter 54, just so you know that he was married to Israel. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 5. For thy maker is thine husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. Thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the horror shall be called. The Lord was Israel's husband. Now, there was a problem. He wanted to marry the nation called the church, but he's married to Israel. Now, remember what Paul said. If the person dies, they're free to marry another. Now, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. See, some of you have limited the cross only for the death of sin. The cross was much more than that. Yes, the cross was to deal with sin, but you must understand why God dealt with sin. What does the word sin mean? It means to miss the mark. What was the mark? The mark was marriage. Anything that caused you to not make the mark of marriage, Jesus came to remove so that you'll be free to marry him. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now listen, listen to the word of the Lord. Verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Let me say the gospel. The gospel which I preached unto you, which also you received and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I have delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day, everyone say according to the scriptures. Why did Jesus have to die? Well, let me tell you one reason he had to die. One of the foremost reasons why he had to die is because by dying, he loosed himself from the law of marriage to Israel. By raising, he was free to marry another. Everybody say, God wants a wife. Now, now, but we had a problem. We were bound to the law of sin and death. Therefore, we were not free to marry. But God had a plan. You can't come to me, so I'll come to you. Watch this, watch this. Come to the book of 1 Peter chapter 1. See, a lot of you don't get the fullness of the cross. That's why after a while it's, it's boring to you. Mm-hmm. You'll love me when I'm over. 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 19. Or actually, I'll start at verse 18. Let's understand the purpose of the cross. You see, God was the one that instituted covenant. If you don't understand covenant, you don't understand the Bible. The word covenant is the same word as testament. The entire Bible is covenant. To understand the Bible, you must understand covenant. Covenant is a binding agreement between two or more individuals or parties. Marriage is a covenant. Because that's what God wanted, marriage. The whole point of salvation is for God to marry. 
So now watch how this works. Watch how this works. According to the custom of the day and age where God started, a man could not just simply have a wife. He had to give a dowry. Watch how this worked. When the man approached the woman in Jewish customs, what he would oftentimes do is take a silver chalice and push it towards her, filled with a drink. Normally a drink of wine. If she looked at the cup and pushed it aside, she was like, no, nah, baby, you ain't for me. <laughs> Don't think so. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> but, but if she took the cup and drank it, she accepted his marriage proposal. Now you understand the communion table. As often as you drink this cup, you do show forth my death until I come. Now, now watch this, watch this. After he did this, he had to give, show that he could take care of her on her status. If she was what's called a peasant woman, a woman that was a villager, then you brought some chickens and some goats and some sheep. You showed her father that you could take care of her. But if she was royalty, you better not bring that. You gonna get killed. You bring gold, silver, and costly array, expensive clothing. If she was distinct royalty, which means she could trace her royal lineage back four generations, you didn't bring her that. You brought her unique gifts from around the world. And your servants brought, you brought caravan full of gifts, and your servants announced the gifts as they came. This is silk from China. This is gold from Africa. God said, I want to marry you. The cross was meant to tell you your status. So God said, I am not going to pay for you with what anybody else can produce because that's insulting. That does not tell your value. That does not tell your true worth. So now listen to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed, bought with corruptible things of silver and gold, it was below you. He would not use money, the wealth of the world, to pay for you. Because it was below you. He devised something that nobody else could come up with that was unique to show how unique you were to him. Nobody else can produce this. Nobody else can do this. Look what he said. Look what he says, verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, I give you sinless blood because it shows how unique you are to me. Will you marry me? The cross was a dowry. The cross was a down payment for a bride. He came and paid for his bride. Let me tell you why I believe in one God. Because he came himself to get his bride. He didn't send Gabriel. He didn't send Michael. He didn't send the second person of the Trinity. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He wouldn't trust getting his bride to anybody else. He came himself. He slipped in the back door of his own world, laid his head in a manger. All God, all man, a mystery in flesh. While he drank from Mary's breast the milk, he was actually producing the milk he was drinking. While he was being held in her arms, he was actually holding up the world that she was walking on. All God, all man in flesh. Coming to get away. Give somebody a high five and say, I know he wants me. 
can't have low self-esteem and understand the cross. Now we had a problem. Let's go to Romans chapter 6. We had a problem. The problem is we were bound to a law called the law of sin and death. Therefore, as long as we were bound by this law, we were not free to marry another. He was now free through death, burial, and resurrection. He was free to marry another. Watch this, watch this. He says, I love you. I want you to be my wife, but I want no beat up bride. Imagine a, a woman coming down in her bridal gown, veil all tilted, dirt all over her, ripped apart in her dress, and she bleeding and walking down, going, yeah, I love you too, baby. <laughs> so he said, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to take the real substance of this blow, and I'm only going to ask you to fulfill the symbol of it. Now Romans chapter 6 that we quote all the time. Romans chapter 6. You've got to understand the salvation plan. Romans chapter 6 verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ. Was baptized into his what? Yeah. So the reason why you must be baptized is because you must die in order to loose yourself from the law of sin and death. So that you're free to marry another. Yeah. Don't tell me you don't have to be baptized. You're not free to marry. You can't fulfill the purpose of salvation. Listen to this now. Verse 4, therefore we are buried with him. I didn't say them, I said him. With him by baptism into death that is like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so we should also walk in the newness of life. So we go through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus in symbol. He took the substance and we come up out of that water. We are now free to marry another. I'm free. Praise the Lord, I'm free. No longer bound. No more chains holding me. It's such a... Such a blessing. I'm just resting. Praise the Lord. Someone shout hallelujah. I'm free. All right, now, your God is romantic. Oh, yes, he is. No, no, y'all don't get it. No, all right, all right, all right. Some of y'all looking at me like Ronald McDonald, so I'm going to help you out and give you a happy meal. <laughs> go, to, go, to, go to Ephesians chapter 1. Go to Ephesians chapter 1 so you can see what I'm talking about. Ephesians chapter 1. Your God is a lover. He's a connoisseur of love. Hallelujah. You knock your socks off. Listen to this. Ephesians chapter 1. You've got to hear this. Ephesians chapter 1. Because now, now you're free. Now, watch the way this works. Watch the way this works. Watch the way this works. A woman comes to the altar. She's a single woman. She's coming to be married. She's a single woman. She walks up to the altar. She undergoes covenant. Covenant takes three things, speech, witnesses, and blood or sacrificial giving. She comes up, that's why the couple must talk to each other, even though there's a minister present. They must speak and say vows. Two, there has to be witnesses by law. You cannot be married even if there is a minister without having two to three witnesses. That's covenant, that's law. And then finally, three, there must be blood or sacrificial giving. That's why the continual giving to each other. 
to keep covenant alive and functioning. So she walks up to an altar. She walks up with a, a name. When she walks to this altar and undergoes this ceremony, all of a sudden she's turned around and she's introduced as a new person. She has taken on a new name and now has a new identity. That is baptism. You went down with one name, you came up with another name. My name is Gerald Jeffers Jesus, nice to meet you. I, I, I came to salvation single, but I'm walking away married. But hold on, hold on. According to law, the marriage is not vindicated until it is consummated. So if there's no intimacy, marriage off. Even the Jews practice that. The very next day, you didn't waste no time with this. The very next day after the marriage, the entire village came out to see the couple. And what they wanted to see was the sheets hanging outside the door to show that there was blood from the consummating of the marriage and that intimacy was so, the marriage was sealed. Without intimacy, there is no marriage. So that's why it's not enough for you to be baptized in Jesus' name. You must receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. No, 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 no. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Jesus is sitting at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Or, excuse me, not the marriage supper of the Lamb. He's sitting at the table with his disciples. He's undergoing the ritual of the Passover meal. There were three pieces of bread. According to the Jews, they would take the middle piece of bread and they would break it. They thought it stood for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they could never figure out why they were breaking Isaac. What did Isaac do? <laughs> Jesus picks up that bread and says, no, 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 no. Isaac is a type of me. This is my body. It's broken for you. When you look at a piece of matzah, it has brown striped, pierced holes. He said, I'm going to be broken, striped, and pierced for you. That's how bad I want you. Then what they do is they would take one piece of the bread, which they had broken off, they would wrap it in a linen cloth, and they would go hide it somewhere in the house. At the end of the ceremony, they would send the women, they would send the young children to go find it, like hide and go seek. They would have to go find it. And whoever found it, whoever got it and came back, they were given a gift. So God said, what's going to happen to me is I'm going to be broken, pierced, and whipped for you. I'm going to be put into a linen cloth. I'm going to be buried and hidden from you. But if you find me, I'll give you a gift called the Holy Ghost. <laughs> You need to know your God. So now watch this. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And, and watch this here. Verse 13. Verse 13. In whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And whom also that you believed and you were everyone say sealed. You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Which is the earnest of our inheritance. Earnest means, you know, like we talk about earnest money. It means it's a down payment. The Holy Ghost is the down payment yes. on heaven. Yes. How do you know I'm going? Because, yeah, I got the down payment right here. If you lose the down payment, the agreement is off. Listen to this, listen to this, which is the earnest of our inheritance until, everyone say until, until the redemption of the purchased possession, until he comes back to get you. You're married. Our problem is you keep acting like you're single. Now, 
Now, take a look at this. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, just so you understand the purpose. The purpose of God, you've got to see this. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. You've got to understand the balance here. Paul said this, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. I'm going to give a chance to get them up on the screen because I want you to see this. Paul says this. He says, I'm jealous over you. With the, everyone say a godly jealousy. It means I'm extremely protective over you. Why are you protective? For I've espoused you to one husband. Hmm. That I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. This one verse is the entire job of the ministry. It is to present the church as a chaste virgin to Jesus. Adam wants his Eve. And you're the Eve. Now watch this, watch this, watch this. He is so massive. Remember, our bodies are a, is the image of God. Not just our bodies, but part, our bodies, the image of God. We're broken up into three parts. First, first Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. He said, I pray that God sanctify you holy, spirit and soul and body. Why do you have three parts? So I'm going to tell you why I believe in one God. We don't have three heads on one body. We got one body and one head. We got one body that has three parts. Anything with more than one head is a freak, including God. <laughs> Say amen. Yes. So now, what do you mean? The spirit symbolizes the father. That's the command center of the man. The soul symbolizes the Holy Ghost because God moves the soul. As the word, Greek word psych speaks of your mind and your emotions. God moves on your mind and your emotions. But the body, that's Jesus. Thou hast prepared a body for me. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. One head, three parts. We are in the image of God. But now, watch this, watch this. What has now happened is your God is desirous to bring you into intimate relationship. Someone just lift your hands a moment and open up your mouth and just worship him a moment. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Come on, while we're worshiping sound people, you can get 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2. Just keep worshiping a moment. You're God's a lover. You're God's a lover. You're God's a lover. You've got to understand the plan of salvation according to God. All right, now listen to this, listen to this, listen to this. You got to see this. God gives you the Holy Ghost, all right? When, if I go by a sneaker, I don't, my, my foot is a size 12. You know, big foot represents a big man, you know that. But, so I don't go in and ask for a size 12 tongue. I go in and ask for a size 12 shoe because the tongue comes with the shoe. The tongue is not the Holy Ghost. The word tongue means language. The tongue comes with the Holy Ghost. Now, he that speaks in an unknown tongue doesn't speak unto men. Who does he speak to? Watch this. No man understands him, howbeit in the spirit he speaks mysteries. You see, couples, uh, uh, my doctor is in Christian counseling, couples undergo what they call romantic speech or pillow talk. This is the talk they say to each other. They use little words that they, do, and lots of times they will say it in private because they don't want nobody else to hear. See you later, tiger. <laughs> now, now, now watch your God, watch your God. He is so romantic till he does not want to wait till private to have a private conversation. 
So he developed something called the tongues of the Holy Ghost that allows no one to understand what you're saying except him. So you can say romantic things to him anytime you want to, and nobody knows what you're saying. Somebody release the tongues of the Holy Ghost in this house. I'm married to another, I'm married to another, I'm married to another. Now, go to Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 14. Now, Song of Solomon is one of those books in the church that we tell everybody to leave alone. Don't go there. <laughs> Okay, now, I understand, to be honest, why we say it a lot of times, because it's X-rated. When the Lord told me to go start reading the Song of Solomon, he said, if you want to understand my mind, go to the Song of Solomon. I'm in Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 14. He said, go to the Song of Solomon. I had two questions for God. Well, really, one major one. What's this doing in the Bible? He said, let me explain something to you. What you're embarrassed over, I created, and I'm not embarrassed about what I created. He said, mm -mm, no, I'm going to write an entire book on it. You can get all red in your face if you want to. Now, the man in the, song, in the book symbolizes God. The woman symbolizes his lover. That's what the Song of Solomon is about. Listen to what the man says to the woman. Oh, my dove. I tell husbands, if you don't know what to say to your wife or wives, you don't know what to say to your husband, speak out of the Song of Solomon. Oh, my dove. I'm romantic and biblical. It don't get much better than that. Oh, my dove, thou art in the clefts of the rock. Now, what are you trying to say? He had led her out of her house and taken her up into the mountains, and she was caught between a rock and a hard place. Listen to his request now that she's caught between a rock and a hard place. Let me see thy countenance. Remember, women that day and age wore veils. Take your veil off and let me see your face. Listen to his request. I want to see your face, and listen to this. I want to hear your voice. Why do you want to see my face? Why do you want to hear my voice? Because your voice is sweet to me. And your face is calmly, or your countenance, calmly, meaning it's beautiful. Yeah. See, some of you don't get it. God calls you to sing. You say, uh-uh, they don't call me Amy Grant, they call me Amy Grunt. Mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> mm -mm. No, 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 no. Why would you want me to sing? There's people that sing ten times better. You don't get it. It's not their voice. Well, you say, wait a minute, what, what, are you, what are you trying to tell me? No, 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 no. Their voice isn't your voice. He, does, he devised your voice, and your voice individually is sweet to him. So although they're singing, and they're singing awesome, it's still not your voice. I want to hear your voice. Show me your face. You want to see my face? Show me yours first. Draw nigh to God, he draws nigh to you. Draw nigh to God and show me your face. I'll draw nigh to you and show you. Your voice is sweet to me. That's why God wants you to sing to him. The Bible says, sing, O barren. Look at Isaiah chapter 54, verse 1. Sing, O barren. You got to learn to sing. Sing to me. Sing, O barren. Thou does not bear, thou does not bring forth. Sing to me. I want to hear your voice. Well, what do you mean? Go to Psalm 145, or excuse me, Psalm 149, verse 5. Psalm 149, verse 5. You got to see this. You got to hear him. He loves to hear you. Amen. Now, watch God. He doesn't talk about quality of voice whenever he talks about singing. Someone say, Thank you. <laughs> because God made nightingales and God made crows. <laughs> so you might sound like a crow, baby, but crow on. <laughs> crow on, honey.
Now understand, we might not put you in the choir and give you a mic. But when you in your bathroom grab your toothbrush, strike your pros and say, hey! Watch this, watch this. You're God's a lover. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Do you know God loves to be serenaded? He wants to hear your voice. Sing to him when you lay in your bed. Now you might bring a tear to someone else's ear. Sing. They may tune an engine by your voice. Sing. He loves to hear your voice. Let me hear your voice. Your voice is sweet. Someone lift your hands and let God hear your voice. Let him hear your voice. Let him hear your voice. Lift your hands. Lift. Let him hear your voice. Let him hear your voice. Now, watch to God the way this is supposed to go. You didn't marry your wife in order to get a baby. If you did, you married for the wrong reasons. You don't marry God to get souls. You marry God to get God. This is not lab work. What's happened to many of you, you're wanting to you're win souls, but you've turned it into lab work. Artificial insemination. Step one, step two, step three. You go through process without intimacy. And you think God is pleased because you have a baby. The baby is meant to be the result and the product and the proof of intimacy. Intimacy. Into me see. Now watch how this works. We keep we keep putting praise and worship together. They are two separate things. See, when you praise, you dance with God. Let me show you just a little about praise. Go to Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3. Just, just look, a little, look a little bit at this. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3. The Bible says the angels cried one to another. Everybody say cried one to another. They cried holy, holy, holy. Notice this. They weren't crying it to God. They were crying it to each other. Praise is when you talk about God. Worship is when you talk to God. Praise is when you brag about God. That's my man right there. I know you're jealous. <laughs> I don't blame you. See, the humble, see, my soul shall make the, my boast in the Lord. Mm -hmm. See, praise is when you cry one to another. But now, let's go to St. John chapter 4, start at verse 23. St. John chapter 4, verse 23. Worship now. Worship is not something you can command because worship is love. The Greek word for worship, pros kineo. The first word pros means towards. The second word kineo means kisses. When you worship God, you kiss God. <laughs> worship is intimacy. So now, when you look at St. John chapter 4, starting at verse 23, St. John chapter 4, verse 23, Jesus is making the declaration. He says, the hour comes now is, everyone say, we're the true worshipers. They shall worship the Father in and in, listen to this, for the Father seeketh such to worship. See, praise is commanded. Let everything that has breath do what? You command praise. You can't command worship. The Father seeks for worshipers. He's seeking for lovers. Praise is when you flirt with God. You dance with him. See, when I, got in, when I got in church, I didn't stop dancing. I just changed partners. You dance with God. You, you, you flirt with God. You interact with God. Worship is when you slow down and you head to the bedroom. 
You wear God's favorite cologne. Let my prayer be as incense. Prayer is God's favorite cologne. His favorite perfume. It's an aroma. You walk into the bedroom and you prostrate yourself down. That's the bowing of your will. The word comes, as we heard earlier, and impregnates you, depositing a seed. Out of that intimacy and out of that seed, you produce character, you produce fruit. You bring forth souls. Otherwise, everything reproduces after its own kind. And some of you, God doesn't want to reproduce. That's why God first works on healing you. Because he doesn't want to reproduce your pain. That's why last night God moved to heal you. Because God doesn't want that reproduced. Souls are one when you have a love affair with God. Go to St. John chapter 21. Let me close this out. St. John chapter 21. You've got to see this. You've got to see why we do what we do. St. John chapter 21 and get the fullness. I do this because I'm married. Someone say, I'm married. St. John chapter 21 starting at verse 15. Verse 15. St. John chapter 21 verse 15. Now here's the problem we're having. There's a difference between a wife and a maid. What's happening to many of you is you're becoming maids. The maid works for the husband, but is not intimate with the husband. And what's happening to some of you, you are so busy with the work of the Lord that you don't have time for the Lord of the work. And you have confused spending time with the work of the Lord with spending time with the Lord of the work. You're a maid. A maid goes to the bedroom, but she goes to clean up. A maid does it to get paid. Her payment, souls. A wife does it because she loves her husband. She does the same thing. She'll clean up the house. She'll straighten things up. But she does it because she loves him. Listen to this. St. John chapter 15, 21, verse 15. So when they had dying, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He said unto him, yes, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. What did Jesus say? Feed my lambs. The reason why I counsel, the reason why I preach, the reason why I feed God's people is not just to get some kind of results. I feed you because I love him. That's why we go after souls. Let me tell you why we go after souls. The reason why we go after souls, God wants a bride. What are you trying to say? God is so massive. He is so massive that the human body is the image. It takes one trillion cells to make up the human body. Each cell has the ability to live on its own. It is going to take all of us from the beginning of time to the end of time that shall be saved to make one bride for God. We will become cells within the body of Christ. Make, it's not brides, it's bride. And so that's why, that's why someone lift your hand and say, I'm married to him. Amen. See, I'm married to God. You've got to understand how this works. Someone, if you're a woman and someone starts flirting with you, you say, excuse me, I'm already married. I'm not interested. <laughs> well, you see, that's what God is looking for with you as the member of the church. When depression starts flirting with you, wanting to lay down with you, you say, excuse me, I'm already married. You can't come lay down in my bed because I've already got a lover. You are not allowed in my house because I already have a husband. Somebody shout, his name is Jesus. He's my husband. He's my lover. He's my friend. Can I tell you just a little bit about my Jesus? Look at Song of Solomon chapter 5 verse 16. Just so you can see just a little bit about my Jesus. Song of Solomon chapter 5 verse 16. You see what God wants is he wants you to be passionate about him. If you're passionate about him, you will automatically become passionate about what he's passionate about. So you must understand first that he is a lover. 
Now listen, this is the woman talking about him. My, his mouth is sweet. How do you know his mouth is sweet? I've kissed him. That's worship. Yea, he's all together lovely. This is my beloved. This is my friend. Hallelujah. So why do I lift my hands and open up my mouth? That's called worship. <laughs> because you see, when you enter into worship, you stop clapping your hands. Clapping your hands is praise. But when you go to worship now, you lift your hands because the lifting of your hands starts symbolizing submission and surrender. That's why when someone puts a gun in your back, you lift your hands, meaning I submit. So worship is submission. I submit to you. Do with me anything you want to do with me. I am your lover. Yes, I am. And you are my lover. I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. Jesus is mine. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. I have a lover. That's why when you see me struggling, honey, don't you feel sorry for me? I have a lover. God said, I wish some of you would just act like you're married. Tell fear you can't stay with me. I'm married. Tell loneliness you got no place with me. I'm married. Tell self-pity you can't stick with me. I'm married. I'm married to another. Yes, I am. I am the bride of Christ. And when I get intimate with him, I will produce fruit. I will become, the Bible says the two become one. That's why when you become intimate with him, you start becoming like him. If you join yourself to a harlot, you become one with a harlot. If you join yourself to God, you become one with God. That's why you can produce the things that are of God. Because now you're one with God. I am married. Yes, I am. That's why I lift my hands. That's why I open up my mouth. That's why I tell the devil, you are not my Lord. You are not my ruler. You are not my husband. I am free from the law of sin and death. I am married to one husband, even to Christ. I will not be joined to depression. I will not be joined to loneliness. I've got one husband. Somebody shout hallelujah in this house. Come on and lift your hands again. And lift your hands to him right now. Do you understand the plan of salvation? God wants a wife. Can I close with this scripture as we're getting ready to read? Look at Genesis chapter 15 verse 1. Genesis chapter 15 verse 1. You must understand God. Genesis chapter 15 verse 1. After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram a vision saying, Fear not Abram, for I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. God is your exceeding great reward. Not souls. Jesus warned us, Matthew chapter 7, he warned us. Look at this, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Jesus warned us, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. You've got to see this, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. 20, um, excuse me, Matthew chapter, chapter, chapter 21, verse 7. Reverse it, I'm sorry, it's 7, 21, 7, 21, I'm sorry. Chapter 7 of Matthew, verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Go to verse 22. Listen to Jesus warning us. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in the name? In other words, we use the gifts of the Spirit. Have we not cast out devils in the name? In other words, we, we were used in power. 
And have we not done many wonderful works in thy name? In other words, we were using the saving of souls, building of buildings. We did many wonderful works. He doesn't call them liars. Look at the next verse. Listen to what he says. Verse 23. And then while I profess unto them, I never knew you. How do you win souls, cast demons out, be using gifts, and God say, I don't know you? The Greek word there for no means I don't recognize or acknowledge you. I don't remember seeing your face in my bedroom. I see you got a lab coat on, which means you've been winning souls through artificial insemination. Because you haven't been intimate with me. You haven't shown me your face. You haven't revealed to me your wounds. You're too embarrassed even to cry with me because you're afraid what others are going to think. And you want to present all of this as justification for being with me? Depart from me. You're a worker of iniquity. Iniquity means gross sin. Sin means to miss the mark. You have grossly missed the mark. You made the mark about ministry, winning souls, and the mark was marriage. Because the byproduct of marriage is you will have children. And if you love me, you will feed my kids. You don't do it simply because you love souls. You do it because you love me. And if you love me, you will feed them. Anybody married to Jesus? Anybody married to Jesus? Anybody married to Jesus? Come on, singers, he knows my name. Come on, I'm talking about your lover. I'm talking about your husband. He knows my name. And he hears me when I call. Come on, church. He does. Yes, he does. He loves you. He's married. tell you this what we just heard we have this treasure in earthen vessels that was so powerful the message before so powerful but can I tell you that it is true we have that treasure in earthen vessel but can I tell you something because of how much he loves you he has elevated your value to bride of Christ you are the apple of his eye seeks you out to bless you. And what he's asking from you is that I'm madly in love with you. Would you become madly in love with me? So now you obey me, not because it's a rule, but if you love me, keep my commandments. All men shall know you are my disciples, not by your doctrine, but by your love, one Would you come to church? Because coming to church is where we've agreed to go on our date. It's our rendezvous point. Meet me at the same place at the same time. Come dressed, come ready. Put on your garment of praise. Have on your robe of righteousness. And come and meet me. Why do you read your Bible? Well, you don't read your Bible just to learn a bunch of laws. You read your Bible because you're learning about me. And the more you learn about me is the more you can love me. That's why I tell you to study the word. You don't study the word to preach. You don't study the word to win souls. You study the word to know me. Because if you know me, you will be able to reach people. Why do you sing? 
Oh, you don't sing just because you have beautiful voices and we love this. You sing because I love to be serenaded. You don't sing to the people, you sing to me. Yeah. Come on, he knows.
sandstorm right now. I want you to hear this. Preachers, I want you to hear this. God does not love you because you work for him. You can't earn God's love. It's too pricey. He loves you not because of your works. He loves you because you're a product of his works. He loves you because you're a product of the cross. He doesn't love you because you preach the gospel. He doesn't love you more because you're a saint. He doesn't love you because you're a pastor. He doesn't love you because you want a bunch of souls. He doesn't love you just because you use the miracles. He loves you because you're his. Your value does not come from what you do. It comes from who you are. And because of who you are, that's why you do what you do. Because he knows my name. Uh, uh, uh. Come on. He knows. Real soft, real soft, real soft. Just whisper, just whisper. so valuable to him. He knows. Ah, my God, somebody's getting this. I feel some chains getting broken. Somebody stopped believing the devil. Somebody started believing God. 